Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top selling authors and the up and coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader. Today, our guest is Sue Mong Kidd, author of The Book of Longings, published by Viking and it'll be released on the 21st of this month. As almost all of you know, Sue's history as an author is almost, I forget that her nonfiction work started back in 1990 with When the Heart Waits, followed by The Dance of the Dissident Daughter, Sue's foray into theology from a woman's point of view, which kind of harkens forward, if you will, to the book we'll be discussing today. Her first novel, The Cigarette Life of Bees, uh, 2002, spent almost three years on the New York Times bestseller list. You may have seen the movie starring a 14-year-old uh, Dakota Fanning, uh, Queen Latifah, I think Alicia Keys, and uh, Jennifer Hudson. Then in 2005 was The Mermaid's Chair, and in 2014, The Invention of Wings, which is the last time I spoke with Sue. It was an interview about that book, another one that sat on top of the New York Times for almost a year. The Book of Longings is a novel which reads as a magical but true history of the middle years of Jesus, those years that the New Testament is silent on, from Jesus as a preteen, if you will, until he becomes God's choice as the Son of Man. Our protagonist, however, is not Jesus, but Anna, Jesus' wife. A woman is spiritual and is longing, as is Jesus. They make, in many ways, the perfect couple. Our protagonist, however, is not Jesus. Uh, And earlier than Jesus, Anna finds her calling and actually documents it in writing, a skill she acquires when no woman would dare to become a scribe, let alone a prophet of her own being. There are numerous well-drawn crowds of characters, maybe the most important of whom is Anna's Aunt Yalta, who is her mentor, her spiritual guide, and the second true love of her life. I don't want to say fun, but that is how I felt because there's lots of heroes and villains, which not only creates intrigue and suspense, but also flushes out the idea that people are people, whether 2,000 years ago or now, which unfortunately we see in this topsy-turvy world we live in now. So perhaps the gnomon for this entire book, much like the obelisks in Alexandria that Anna marvels at, is that life is life, and death is death. So welcome, Sue, and thanks so much for joining us again, amazingly, six years later than the last time we spoke. Oh, it's so nice to be back and talk with you again. I appreciate that. Well, so obviously, Jesus is a major part of the lives of scores of millions of people in our country and billions in our world today. But others, me, perhaps you, feel a fascination for this man uncoupled from the idea of him as the Messiah or an aspect of the Holy Trinity. So why is it that a carpenter of humble origins retains with us that fascination 2,000 plus years later? Well, that's the great mystery and question, isn't it? Um, I think we need these figures, apparently. Humans must need a transcendent personal image in which to um, reflect themselves and beyond. So, you know, I don't know that I know the answer to that, (laughs) but I think um, what I was going for was not the transcendent post-Easter Jesus, as some uh, Jesus scholars say, but the human Jesus. I was fascinated by that. Um, The figure who was like us, who was a real human being. And what was interesting to me was that when we emphasize the post-Easter Jesus, and by that I mean who he became, you were just describing who he became in this reality as a divinity, as a the son of God. When we emphasize that to the uh, detriment of seeing his human side, we really lose something. And uh, I think he was an extraordinary human being, and I wanted to try to portray that. It's funny. I always think for a long time I have 
remember Nikos Kazantzakis, The Last Temptation of Christ in the movie, I guess it was Martin Scorsese. Um, I've always thought that all of us have these aspects of the human and the divine. And I always think like Jesus was, this goes to what, your, what you posit. I always think that Jesus, half of him was going, oh, God, why are you, why are you doing this? I would rather just <laughs> hang out, be a carpenter, get married, have kids. And then God says, no, you have to do this. And he, not relents, but eventually he accepts the fact that he's going to be this vessel that eventually saves all of mankind. But he doesn't really want to do it. Do, do you feel kind of like that? Um, well, yes and no. Um, I, I am not completely certain exactly that role as, of Jesus as a transcendent divine figure. I'm more interested in seeing what he's capable of as a human being and inspiring us um, with his, I think, archetypal life. And we can see ourselves by identifying with him and realize that what was capable with him is capable for us. And that's an extraordinary revelation in a way to think that we could aspire. And maybe that's what we lose when we um, only see his divine side and not his human side. So I, I guess I'm looking for a balance. I do think there is divinity in him as there is a divinity in all of, of creatures. And I feel like um, his life was so exemplary, exemplary. I can't say that word. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> Take out a syllable. Yeah. Exemplary. Thank you. Oh, my. Um, that that he becomes this um, figure for all history and all mankind and womankind. So his life um, maybe is what ours should be more like. It's funny because at first I was kind of disappointed there aren't any miracles. But then after <laughs> I read a while, I realized, you know, this is a much better way of telling the story because you have the same cast of characters, but they take on yeah. slightly different roles. And that was, you know, really cool. And the only miracle possibly happens at the very, very end, especially, I can't do spoilers, but <laughs> especially yeah. with, with there's sawdust on his hands, you know, yeah. the, the fact Anyway, I don't I won't spoil it. But yes, so you decided to take the miracles out, but leave the characters in. I did. Um, I said to myself, OK, are you going to write from a religious point of view? I mean, I'm a cultural Christian. I grew up in that tradition um, and have a very strong spiritual side. And I revere the figure of Jesus uh, very much. But. I decided that I wanted to be a novelist with this story and not write from a religious perspective. Um, so I just took him as a human being, but as an amazing, extraordinary human being who had a message that is saving. And I think his teachings and his message it can be very saving for our world right now, which was sure. something I was happy to um, put in the novel. Because, um, you know, his message was basically about love and compassion and inclusion and justice. And uh, so we could use some of that. Uh, we could use a lot of it, especially since we have, well, I'll say it's like satanic forces <laughs> pushing us <laughs> the other way. <laughs> um, well, before I go off on my weird tangent, why don't you give us, well, especially the listeners, because they're going to want to know because, you know, the comparisons. Uh, to the Red Tent and other books are in all the reviews. Give us a thumbnail sketch about Anna. Is it pronounced Anna? Am I pronouncing it? I actually say or Anna. Anna. Okay. But I think, I think your version sounds lovely, though. <laughs> I just thought because uh, there was a missing N. Yeah. Well, I, I'm happy to try to give a thumbnail. Let's see. I know we've talked a lot about Jesus here which is normal and natural because, after all, I wrote a novel in which Jesus gets married. So, you know, what could go wrong there? Um, but this is really Anna's story. 
um, through and through. Uh, Jesus is an important character in it. And I did feel a lot of trepidation about how I went about it. And I thought very carefully and I didn't take it lightly, believe me. But the one who is the central protagonist and who drives this story is definitely Anna. And I saw her as a young woman who not only would become the wife of Jesus, but who had her own magnitude and her own passion and who um, just a brilliant, ambitious young woman who was full of longings. And her longings had to do with having her own voice in the world and being a scribe and being able to write the lost stories of women. She had what she called a largeness in herself, something that her Aunt Yaltha reminds her that everybody has a largeness in themselves. But the real trick is bringing it forth into the world. And um, Anna does this with her superpower, I call it, which is (laughs) fierceness and daring and even a touch of rebelliousness, or maybe a lot of rebelliousness. So she's essentially a dissident in her way, and she's she's deciding her own fate, and she's on a quest. And it is essentially a feminist quest, really. Um, that's I really think there is a lot of relevance about women who are silenced and marginalized and need to bring forth their stories in the world today. This is the same thing going on in my novel, in the first century. It's funny, me being an old white man, not as old as Bernie or Joe <laughs> or Trump, but I come, I come to feminist books with a thir- certain predisposition. I can't help it. And so at first I thought, oh, it's just another just book feminist. And then I realized what you're saying is these women existed and men haven't allowed them to exist. And you make them that very clear, but they had, they all had their own stories and their stories were just as important, but the Bible doesn't let them have those. And then I came around. Yeah, great. Um, I think that um, about, I think it's something like 1.1%. So it's under 2% of all the words in the Bible are spoken by women. Um, most, and, and 49% of those are not even named. So women are more or less um, invisible in the scriptures in a way. And we have to sort of um, search for them and um, work with it a little bit. The scriptures, as a lot of scholars say, were written by men for men. So this is a new take on, it's probably a radical take on a woman's view or a woman's uh, experience in the New Testament scriptures, so to speak, or even the time before they are recorded, which is where most of the novel takes place in the years when Jesus was 12 to 18. And we have no record of him. And we have just a, a small amount of, of scriptural um, references in the, in the novel. The other thing that I didn't realize, but it's very interesting and well done on your part, is that this idea of Jesus being married didn't arise full blown from like Athena from Zeus's head. You did a copious research in the Bible to come up essentially with an answer that's not an answer, but this could have been, this could have happened. There's nothing that disproves yeah. it. Absolutely. It could have happened. Um, You know, as a novelist, I think what is important is to um, show what is possible, not just to show the condition of of our world and our culture and humankind, which is important, but to say what might be possible beyond that or to look at an alternate history that kind of jolts us into some understanding of something and puts the world in perspective. So that's what I was going for here. Um, that, that story for me was a real possibility. Um, and why? Because we don't know if Jesus was married or not. So the scripture is silent on the matter. And 
A lot of people believe that Jesus was married. A lot of people believe that he wasn't married. Someone pointed out to me, well, if the scriptures didn't say it, then he probably wasn't married. But I would really take issue with that because the the scriptures are silent on women pretty much across the board. And um, they may not have thought to even include that. Um, it seemed rel- relatively possible that um, Jesus could have married when he was younger. I mean, most Jewish men at that time married when they were around 20 or so. And he could have had a wife at some point who maybe didn't make it um, past childbirth because about half of them died during that uh, experience. Um, So you don't know. I mean, I really don't know personally whether Jesus was married or not. And I I tend to think that it was possible and maybe even lean a little bit toward it being likely. But, you know, we we just don't know. You mentioned in that answer about the world and and Anna's interplay with it. You could almost it's not like it's a picaresque novel, but why don't you give us a little travelogue of you know, mm-hmm. where she started and where she went and where she went and where she went and the reasons why she went there. Yeah, she gets around a little bit, doesn't she? Um, she was raised, born and raised in the city of Sepphoris, which I never knew about growing up in church. I never heard of it. And that's because it was not discovered archaeologically until um, maybe the 70s. Um, don't hold me to that. But I think that um, Anna is there in the capital of Galilee. And this is an extraordinary city. It was um, a wealthy um, kind of intercultural city. And it is only three miles from Nazareth. So there's a lot of speculation by scholars now that Jesus would have walked over and perhaps had found work there. And which is something I used in the novel. And, um, of course, he's going to meet Anna at some point. And I wouldn't dream of telling you how they meet or how they came to be married. Um, But so there's Sepphoris. And she then when she's married, she moves to Nazareth, which is only three miles away. And then she finds herself sailing off on the Mediterranean to Alexandria, Egypt which is a very necessary and unfortunate thing that she has to do, but it is uh, important in her life, extraordinarily important. And then she's going to also be in Jerusalem. So she's in uh, Galilee, she's in Egypt, and she's in Judea. And um, I'm sure you have the same dream that I do. But when she's in Alexandria and she goes to the library, isn't that something you've always wished? Oh, book people would love this. I know. I had so much fun imagining this place. I bet. (laughs) I had to, um, I sketched it, um, trying to imagine what it might look like. And there are composites that you can find online based on some travelers, you know, descriptions. but it would have been an, an amazing place. Yes, I would love to have been there. And when Anna goes in, I mean, she feels like she's, you know, in heaven. And um, she imagines that her own work will be there one day. It kind of For reminds sure. me, it reminds me of when I was yearning to write fiction long ago, it seems like now. And I remember going in a bookstore, an independent bookstore, and standing in front of the um, new releases and looking at the, all of those uh, beautiful, colorful book jackets and feeling such a yearning to see my work up there and ca- I could hardly imagine it. Um, it was that feeling I drew on when Anna's standing in the library. And she wants her work to be on those, the scrolls to be on those um, shelves. Oh, it's the same feeling she had um, when, um, I didn't know how to pronounce this wrong, um, 
the head of um, Therapeutai. Therapeutai. Uh, the, yeah, you know, I'm not sure how to say that either. It's, uh, I think it's probably Therapeutai. I'm told. So, <laughs> so when she's there and her scrolls are not transcribed, but they're made into those the codexes. Yes. That's the same feeling you might have had. <laughs> That's right. That's you... right. Yeah. I drew a lot on um, my feelings about having a voice and writing. Uh, I mean, lo and behold, Anna has the same thing. You know, when my husband read the manuscript, he said to me, I, I didn't let him read it ahead or in progress I just always wait we have this tradition when I am finished and I know I'm done I let him read it and um, he he said to me oh I see Anna and you and you and Anna and I thought oh dear (laughs) what what have I revealed here but I mean some of it's quite obvious and this is one of them the I I pulled a lot of my own thoughts and feelings and put them in Anna I guess but here's a question. Anna, and I wondered about this. I thought, well, is this what I would do? Is this the right thing to do? It, it seemed like she had to carry her work with her. She always had to have a bag in which she put her scrolls and hand carry the bowl. Yes. And I, and I wonder if you would feel that, that you had to take everything with you. I wondered about why she had that feeling that her work had to travel because she had to have a way to make sure that her voice was heard and she couldn't leave it behind because that was a risk. I think that's part of it, but I'm going to tell you the truth. The truth is it's a, a literary device I had to use in order to carry that material with her. She needed to have it uh, throughout the various um, places in geographic landscapes she went to. She needed to have this with her. You know, that bowl, this incantation bowl, which is extremely significant in the plot and the narrative, is like an icon that holds her longings. And I loved having it because things can get very abstract, you know, when you're longing for something or you want something and you want to concretize it and have it kind of visible and touchable and real for the reader. And so I I just put it all in that bowl where you can see it and feel it. And so she had to lug that thing around, yes, all the way to Egypt and and back and back again. And so I think part of it was that I just needed it as part of the narrative as she, as the story evolved. But that's not the whole case. I mean, it's also true what you said, that um, she wanted it with her. And that maybe not so much because, well, let's say because um, it had great meaning for her. And I think we need these touchstones. You should see my study. I mean, it's filled with things like that, you know, uh, things that are touchstones that they're little talismans or something that remind me of things that I need to be reminded of. Yes. Also interesting with regard to the incantation bowl that what you carry the reader along anyway, but one of the things that really carries the reader along is when she mistakenly, this is not really a spoiler, when the ink blot, the shadow that on the incantation all that shouldn't be there but is you foreshadow the reader thinks oh god no <laughs> pun intended what's going to happen because of that and you you do that several times in the book where there's something that's not quite exactly the way it should be and she worries about it and then she well and he also says all will be well and uh, that's something that it's like one of those things where people tell you live in the moment and maybe I can do that two or three times a day. Um, but all my father used to say, everything will turn out fine and it's not the end of the world. There were two, two things he said. So far, it's worked. And um, 
yeah, there is something about that. Life is life, death is death, all will be well. Yeah, Yalta was one for sl- these kind of sayings. And I thought I had so much fun writing her character. And I think she is the most unique character of any I've ever written. Uh, I just loved her. And she's a little outrageous at times. She's, um, But she's, she's a lifeline to Anna. And... Uh, more than a sidekick. I mean, she's really important in Anna's life. They have something like a sacred alliance in a way. And um, they were inseparable, you know. She was the real mother to her and a sister and a mentor. And even, I would say, a kind of midwife to her spiritual life. So she did say things like, all shall be well. And that is a saying that I stole from St. Julian of Norwich, who was a, a, a saint long ago, and um, who said, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. And there's a, it's a mystical saying, because it's not just um, a surface kind of throwaway line. It has a deep inner meaning, and that was what Yatha was going for. When they are at Araputai, when they are there and um, Anna has to escape, um, it's, what is the name of um, the beautiful woman's servant that her brother... Oh, Pam- uh, Pamphile. Yeah. I like the, when she's in the wagon and she says, let, let me out. And she... <laughs> she drives a couple more miles before she lets her out. She was yeah, she, up. <laughs> she got her vengeance. She she did. <laughs> I liked her a lot. You know, and I thought that was kind of unfair to make her stay there. I mean, I know that Anna was waiting longer than she was. But I thought, you know, that's a lot to ask, you know? Yeah, it, it was a lot to ask. It was um, Pamphile reacted in a normal manner, but she came through for them. I think she genuinely ha- had a deep love for Lavi and would do anything for him, you know. This is, listen to the dream I had last night. I dreamt that I called my attorney and I asked him to change the casket for my burial. And he said he couldn't. And I said, am I not my own executor? <laughs> He replied, not unless you have two copies of the document. So I mushed together a bunch of stuff. Isn't that a cool dream? That is a very cool dream. You should get on the psychiatric couch immediately and and get an interpretation. I've spent a good portion of my life there. (laughs) It doesn't really (laughs) help that much. Uh, So talk a little bit about Sophia, because... I know what you were getting at. Well, no, I don't, that doesn't sound right. Talk, talk about who Sophia is, not only to women, but to men, because there were men there as well. Yes. I mean, we tend to de-emphasize this extremely amazing aspect that is right there in the New Testament. And that is the being of Sophia. This is the name of the feminine spirit for God um, in the Trinity. So in the Old Testament, the Hebrew version uh, is Ruach. And in the um, New Testament, the Greek, it becomes Sophia. And so we're talking about um, an aspect of God herself or himself. And it is, a, it is written in feminine language. So my character, Anna, wants to pray to and relate to a female aspect of the deity, to see herself um, in the deity and to have a deity that looks like her in her imagery. And that's quite an uh, uh, 
significant thing for women and girls and men to be able to balance our understanding of um, of the divine. You know, there's an old saying that I think it was Mary Daly, who was a feminist theologian, said, if male is God, if God is male, I've got it backward. If God is male, then male will be God. There's some truth in that uh, because when we revere God as male, um, that's our highest value. And therefore, things male and masculine tend to rise to the top. And women um, do not see themselves as valued as much as as men do sometimes. So it's a complicated. I mean, I wrote a whole book on (laughs) looking at this kind of thing, The Dance of the Dissident Daughter. But. Um, it's complex and it's hard to sometimes understand, but it has a powerful impact upon our culture and our and our souls, too, when we don't have this kind of balancing of divinity, because it is such an important aspect, cult- you know, in our psyches. Uh, so Anna reveres. Sophia, and she learns to pray, and she even says at one point in the novel, um, why am I not praying to Sophia? You know, she was having trouble relating otherwise, and she found a way to do that. And actually, one of the very fascinating things, because I thought you did it, was the song to Sophia that Anna composes at the very last minute and I had no idea that it was real. I thought you wrote it. But you yeah, didn't. I wish I, I wish I could have written that. <laughs> um, they were very kind to give me permission to use that in the manner that I did. And it's an, I, I, I have been reading that particular um, document for many years and I'm just amazed at it because it... Um, It gives us a whole other vision of the divine. It was obviously written by a woman, and it was written around the same time that Anna was in Egypt. It was found there, and it's a real Gnostic gospel kind of document. So I hope people will find it. It's called um, The Thunder, Perfect Mind. Right, which relates back to uh, Jesus' nickname, obviously. That's right. That's right. Oh, speaking of characters, here's something that I questioned and then, okay, I understand. So, but readers, if they see Salome, they think of Salome as the woman who, whose mother convinced her to bring her the head of John the Baptist, but that's not the Salome in this book. No, um, Jesus' sister, he has one, I think, named. In one gospel, none of the sisters are named, only the his brothers. And in another one, uh, it's referred to as Salome. So that's why I went with that. But most of the women in the New Testament times were named Mary, believe it or not, or Miriam. And so they they tended to have few names and many women had the same name. And there were a lot of Salome's. I got I thought that um, towards the end, in the most tragic of times, when Mary Magdalena is with her at Golgotha. Because I always thought that if Jesus was married, that's who he would be married to. And there was something in my mind that thought that. Anna would get jealous because there's no, she's just there. And why would she be there? And it's just kind of like, I thought, oh, who is this woman that's accompanying my, at this time? So what did you think about that? I mean, did you have an idea of who she really was? Um, Mm -hmm. You know, the obvious thing to have done would be to have let Mary Magdalene be the wife of Jesus. Right, I mean, right. That would have been almost um, reflexive in a way. So uh, that's why I didn't do it. Um, 
it was too um, familiar and it had a lot of baggage on it. And my real theory was that Jesus probably, as I said earlier, was married around the time he was 20 and that wife probably died in childbirth or something. That was kind of in the back of my mind. Now, that is not what happens to Anna, by the way. Um, But Mary Magdalene, I wanted her. She was a, a very important figure in the story. So I wanted her to have an appearance. Now, I made her an older woman. No one knows how old she really was. And I also, um, there was a little bit of conflict between Anna and Mary Magdalene that was oh, worked good. out. Yeah. So I think um, it just seemed natural to interject that. Um, it's not a big deal, but it's a little bit of that. Yeah. Well, this is not a spoiler, but it could lead to one, which I won't go to. But obviously, when they anoint Jesus after his crucifixion and put him in the tomb that they put him in, I was thinking, how are you going to get out of creating a miracle here? And you did it by like this this motion of it. She just took off. So maybe, maybe that was really good. I didn't expect that. Yeah, it's kind of left up for um, the reader to determine what happened there. And you can read into it what you will. I mean, yeah, we won't we won't give too much away, but um, we're being cryptic, aren't we? But I think Anna um, has her moment, as you may recall, after the death of Jesus. She has her moment with him. Yeah. And the thing about it is, is the miracle, I'm wrong, there are miracles in the book. The miracle is the way that both of them live the lives that they were called to. Yes. Anna with more, more certainty than Jesus, because at the beginning he thinks, well, you know, I felt like I might be called, but then I thought, nah, he's not going to. But Anna knew from the day she got the bowl that she knew. Yeah. I wanted these two to learn from each other. Um, I wanted her to be on an equal par in a way with him. And I think he learned a lot from her and she learned a lot from him and they complimented each other in interesting ways. I mean, someone wrote that um, in one of the early reviews that it was a, a love affair for the ages. And I just smiled because that's what I wanted. I wanted to to portray a great love. And yet at the same time, this marriage had conflict in it. And it mostly grew out of just the cultural and religious um, mores that were there. So, you know, they just had to be human in their in their relationship and in their marriage as well. And so it wasn't a perfect marriage, but it was a great love, I think. I love his laugh. <laughs> yeah, I did too. I figured he, you know, he has a sense of humor. And um, he, I guess I portrayed him in a way that um, I would like to see him, and I do see him. It was different. You don't get that from any of the four Gospels, that type of (laughs) playfulness. Yeah, but you know, he I'm sure he had that side of him, that spirit, um, the laughter, the playfulness, the he teased her. um, He he made jokes and they shared interesting little side jokes. I suspect he would have been like that. You know, I was I was going on. I mean, these were the unknown years, so I could take some license with things. Um, Nobody could say, well, it didn't couldn't have happened that way. But I like to remind people that this is fiction and that Anna is a fictionalized wife. And um, while I think it's all possible, it could have happened that way. um, I was. 
I was extrapolating a lot. I was making things up. I was conjuring out of my imagination. But when it came to the world they lived in and even the historical Jesus, I I relied heavily on my research, which took me about a it took me about a year of just pure research before I even wrote a word. And I could have gone on researching. Um, one day my daughter came over and I was writing. I mean, I was uh, writing in my research notebook and I was sketching something. She said, what is that? And I said, well, that is a aqueduct or a water system in the first century in Sepphoris. And she said, mom, we're going to have to do an intervention. You have got to stop researching and start writing this. And, and I thought, yeah, she's exactly right. What, why do I need to know all this about a, a water system in Sepphoris? So that was my wake up call. And I started writing after that. Still seems like it would be fun in a sense. <laughs> my favorite, yeah. um, my favorite piece of repartee in the book was when Jesus is going off to work for a couple of weeks as a stonemason and she has to rev that thread on her wrist and he goes, what, what's the matter? I'll be gone a couple of weeks. And you're going to forget. And she goes, yeah, I probably forget I had a husband. And uh, <laughs> that was really good. And then I thought, I wonder if Sue's relationship with her husband, they have that same kind of, do you? <laughs> um, well, we've been married 50 one year, so holy macro. Yeah, that's kind of what I say every day. <laughs> no, but he's a great guy. He's a retired psychotherapist, and um, you know we've had many years of um, all kinds of experiences and repartee. Yes, I can say that, but I I still adore him. Well. He'll get to hear it, too, hopefully. <laughs> um, it's funny, hearkening back to what you were saying about the woman's role and the lack of, I don't know, documentation of it. The other side of it is, again, something that older guys have ingrained is, you know, a woman is a housewife. Then they were nice enough to say a woman is a homemaker, which kind of gave her a job. And But then when you look at the list, that Anna compiles of what you have to do mm. as a woman when she's in Nazareth living in a household of many people. And Anna, oh, the goat was great. Delilah, I have a goat. I have three goats. Do you? I yeah. want a goat. I really do. After I wrote this Delilah, the goat, into the story, I wanted one too. <laughs> well, my main goat is named Delilah. Oh. Uh. So that's impossible. First, he was Beatrice because of Dante. Mm. Yeah. And she changed. I don't know. But she's very similar. You know, she has her good side and her bad side. Um, <laughs> there were so many parallels when I read this. Yeah, but that list of chores was like, I'm not going to do that every day. I'm a guy. I don't have to do that kind of stuff. You know, it's just like a knee jerk reaction. Sorry. Yeah. It's it's so sad. <laughs> So sad. But, no, I mean, you know, but Anna, I mean, this division of labor and what women can do and can't do. And this is what she rebelled against. I mean, she um, was was fighting for freedom to do what her brother did. And it must have been tough for women in any era to see their fathers and brothers so free to go and do and be and to be limited and caged, as she said. And at one point, Anna thinks about her brother Judas. And yes, it is that Judas. It's her adopted brother. Um, she talks, he, he is able to go off somewhere and she says, you know, my whole world is a cage. And that was, was very true for women then. And to some extent, these limitations um, have continued in less and less ways, of course, because we have certainly come a long way in 2000 years. But we still have a long way to go. And it was interesting, too, how you set it up so that Anna goes through this trauma and like maybe a year, her mother, her father, 
her husband, her brother, and all these things. And at first, you kind of admire the way she responds, but then each time she does let love in, as Jesus has told her to do during their marriage. And that was interesting. Yeah, she sees a lot of uh, tragedy. And um, I think her sustaining person in her life is after, I mean, it was Jesus and it was Yaltha always, but um, maybe Yaltha was the enduring, sustaining force in her life. Yeah, she said, like that one time when she said, we'll meet again. And Anna thinks, well, there's no way. And and she said it with certainty, but she also said it with not trepidation, but with a foreboding. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so yeah, it's the reason I like your books and other books by certain authors is because you do make the reader think. And it's not like you, you're you just like letting go of the book and saying, here, read it. You're making the reader stop. Oh, one of the reviews said that, that they they stopped reading the book because they they had this, such a feeling that they had to close the book before they could start it back up again. And so you're making the reader do as much work, in a sense, as you did. I think, you know, could this, could this have happened? Would these people have been this way? Should I be this way? Would it be better if the rest of the world would be this? And, and you also, early on, well, uh, without doing miracles, you do the lilies of the field, you do turn the other cheek, you know, you do so many things that you go, oh, well, that's okay. He was a really good guy, and she was a really good mother. Yes, that's I what... wanted to bring in some of the very f- most familiar um, stories and foreshadow them in a way. Um, there's a stoning, too, you know. You, oh, yeah. The one who is without sin cast the first stone. There are numerous events like that. The Good Samaritan, for instance. And you could read that to be, well, you know, Jesus will later tell a parable about the Good Samaritan. So was this an experience that he might have had in his life and then later told a story about it? That's how I was trying, I I was proposing that kind of thing. Um, And his mother is the one in my mind who taught him to say, uh, turn the other cheek. And it took, I mean, I think she probably taught him a lot of things he didn't get a lot of credit. She didn't get credit for. (laughs) So, you know, it was a, um, it was, it was kind of fun in a way. And meaningful to me to be able to put in some of those stories and and suggest that he either lived through them and later taught them or this was when it actually took place was earlier, but was incorporated into the scriptures later. How did you how did you was this from your research? Why Stations of the Cross, essentially, why did you make uh, Jesus? I mean, I've always pictured him dragging the cross up the, up the steps, up the hill. Why did you just have him carry the cross piece? Um, that was based on research. I wonder. I wonder. You know, we have a cinematic idea of uh, how that all went down because of the imagery that we've had over and over. Um, but mostly s- scholars believe that they just carried the cross beam. And those um, uprights would be left permanently in the ground and all they and there were notches in them. And all the uh, Roman executioners had to do was to drop that cross piece onto the upright. So it was an efficient way the Romans figured out how to kill people. And it was brutal. I mean, the more I read about it the more horrifying it really became. You know, when I was younger, well, I'm Jewish, and when I was younger, and uh, Catholic kids would say, you guys, you killed Christ. And, you know, it was horrible. But the thing about it is, as I grew older, 
is it, how do you pronounce his name? Is it Caiaphas, the, guy, the head guy, Ka- the head Jewish? Caiaphas, Caiaphas. So Caiaphas, well, a number of things. You know, it's the Jews who bring him before Pilate. And, and you know, and then Pilate tries to toss it to Herod, and Herod tosses it back to Pilate, and Pilate washes his hands of it. And then the Jews could have, oh, that's something cool you did. You know, when they say, give us Barabbas, when they could have said, give us Jesus. And you, enter, you will interject it, and maybe it's from your research as well, but Barabbas was a zealot, a political prisoner, and they really wanted him let, let go, to be let go. And I didn't know anything about that. I don't know if you kind mm-hmm. of made that up or whether it's from research as well. You know, it's in, I'm trying to remember which gospel that's actually in. But apparently he was a real political figure, yes. And, you know, the, the gospels, the four gospels have differing um, stories yeah. in a way. They differ in how this all happened. Um, but essentially, I, I just took composites of things from the Gospels and put them together as what Anna could have witnessed because it all had to be told from her point of view. And I, I wanted to move through the, that passion story as much as I possibly could. And I did a lot of research to um, – I, I guess the most research I did was on the historical Jesus. It was fascinating. That's why I went down the research rabbit hole and didn't surface for a year, probably, because it was so fascinating. But I had to study everything from how the Romans made crosses and executed crucifixions to just monetary systems and the whole political uh, regime and the cultural religious aspects and I had to study Judaism in the first century and the marriage um, laws and how betrothal happened. I mean, it went on and on and on. There were times I thought, what have I gotten myself into? But um, I, I actually enjoyed all of that and it paid off in a way if, because it met, it brought so much detail and richness to the story. And if there is a tree blooming in that book, I guarantee you it really existed in Palestine at the time. Well, you're talking about a payoff and learning the currency. Well, then when you started talking about talents and pieces of talents and denarius or whatever they are, talent was a lot of money. I yes. Mean, I yes. had no idea. People can actually... Uh, guess at how much the, it would be worth today. I mean, it is a guess, but I'm not sure I can remember exactly what all of that's worth. But yes, there was Greek money and Roman money and um, Egyptian money. So I had to keep it all straight. Yeah, you know, I could go. I mean, there's so many questions I have, even like the mosaic, you know, it's like did they do this? Did he do this? And it, and yes, and you actually, I think in your author's note, you talk about how the mosaic, act, a mosaic like this actually did exist. Well, it did. And I, I mean, it was created, it was a Roman mosaic. It was found on the floor of a palatial house in Sepphoris when they did the archaeological digs and discoveries there, which is still going on. And that mosaic is called the Mona Lisa of Galilee, and she is unbelievably beautiful. And I had a picture of it um, that I kept up on my storyboard, and I often thought of um, Anna when I looked at it. But it was not created in the first century. It was probably in the maybe the fourth century when it was actually created. But I borrowed it for the first century because there were actually first century Roman exquisite uh, mosaics found in Sepphoris. It's interesting the way sometimes you can't picture people, suppose this is made into a movie too, which it probably will be. Um, But you realize because of that mosaic that Anna and therefore her cousin were beautiful. And then Salome, when she looked in that last possession that Anna had the mirror, realized I love the way you put, oh, I'm, and then Anna says, lovely. 
Was it Salome? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was so nice. Well, you have an incredible uh, memory for details in the store in your stories that you read. It's amazing. It's because I took the Evelyn Wood speed reading course when I was a kid. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's um, well, no, it's you. I mean, I know that when I remember the characters like Anne Rand's books, which obviously I don't agree with politically today, but when I remember names like Ellsworth Tui and Dagny Taggart and <laughs> Peter Keating and Howard Wark and Henry Reardon, how do I remember those when I read them when I was 14? So I know that if I remember the characters' names, I know it's a really good book. Uh-huh. So yeah. it's something I've done. Um, okay, well, based on that, I could go on forever. I'm not going to. And normally at this point, I would say to my listeners and to the readers and to my the customers at my independent bookstore, Wellington Square Bookshop, I would say to you, um, Sue, your book's going to be on our front table and you know it's going to be in the window. And now my bookstore is closed. Mm. And like, where am I going to put it? I can't put it. People are buying. Uh, Ingram is drop shipping now. So that's great. So we've gotten lots and lots of orders and I, I can't sell it yet. But today I can sell it. And, you know, our website and our Facebook and our Twitter and Instagram, none of which I know how to operate. But my staff does all that. We're, you know, promoting the book and talking about it. And my introduction will be on there, too. So. I just want to thank you. One, thanks for being here, and thanks so much for writing the book. It was a wonder. Well, thank you for talking with me about it. it, it I thoroughly enjoyed it. We were talking with Sue Monk Kidd, whose new book, The Book of Longings, comes out tomorrow. Sue, of course, you know from The Secret Life of Bees, lots of other books, lots of enormous buzz about this book, and it's well worth it. I strongly suggest that you uh, pick it up as soon as you can. Of course, you can't pick it up because there aren't any bookstores open. But you can go to wellingtonsquarebooks.com and you can order it there or you can also order the audio book. And uh, it's just as quick and efficient as Amazon would be. In any event, uh, Sue was great. I really enjoyed talking to her. And it was nice. I Since we're doing Skype all the time now, it was nice because I got to see her, even though you won't. Um, and we had a really pleasant talk. It's, you know, it's a new world, and this is going to continue to happen. It's like our book clubs at uh, at the bookshop. They can't be live anymore, but that means when we use Zoom or Skype or Microsoft Teams that we can actually have more people, and I don't have to put up folding chairs, so we could literally have 100 people there. So it's well worth it to keep an eye on all of our uh, social media, whether it's our Facebook page or whether it's the website or whether it's Instagram or whether it's Twitter uh, or whether you get uh, an email from us, any of the other ways. So if you just join the book club for the first time, just pop in. You'll have an invitation already, uh, especially if you're one of our frequent buyer members. So uh, like I said, a new world. It's a new now. Uh, What's coming up? And these are ones that, yeah, these will probably be book club books. One is called The Wine Girl. Actually, it's just called Wine Girl. The Obstacles, Humiliations, and Triumphs of America's Youngest Sommelier. She was 21 and a woman when she became the youngest seller of wine in restaurants and is now at this restaurant called Coat. And a lot of you will recognize the restaurants that she's worked at or opened in New York City. And in fact, now we were talking about how she's handling this. And they use this site called caviar.com. So they deliver wine, full dinners, and they also even deliver mixed drinks. And that service is also available downtown. I don't know if it's available out here yet. So anyway, she was excellent. She's still in her early 20s. She's been voted best in Wine Spectator, best in Forbes, best in Fortune 500. Uh, best sommelier in the world, and she was 21 when she started. We'll also be dealing with my third book involving consciousness, and this one's called um, by Donald Hoffman, and it's called The Case Against Reality, Why Evolution Hid the Truth from Our Eyes. And then uh, a really good interview will be the one with Marie Masaki Mockett, who will be discussing her latest, American Harvest, God, Country, and Farming in the Heartland. American Harvest, God, Country, Farming in the Heartland. Great book. Uh, She's a pleasure to talk to. I've spoken to her before. 
and she has a great sense of humor. So that should be a fun interview. As always, thanks for joining us virtually and hope uh, given what's going on now that you'll be able to join us at the book club and the bookstore for real uh, within the next couple of months. So thanks as always for hanging here with us at The Avid Reader and look forward to uh, having you here next week for our next interview. Thanks. <laughs>